Okay, good evening. I'm Richard Summer, the Dean of the Daniels Faculty, and to my left is Mirko Zardini, the Director of the Canadian Centre for Architecture. We're both here to welcome you to this evening's event. Where, where is the critical voice in architecture today? This is the second part of a program organized to help celebrate the CCA's acquisition of Kenneth Frampton's archive. The first part occurred last night uh, at the CCA in Montreal around the theme, Can There Be a Global Architectural History, Architectural History Today? As some of you might know, starting a few years ago, our faculty began to partner with the CCA on, on some public programming. This year, we actually began uh, the, the, our season of public programming with uh, a, a jointly organized event with Noemi Klein and Mirko on the theme, what comes after the environment? All of our events this year were qu questions, so then the CCA was forced into asking a question too. So this uh, event earlier the, in the fall was linked to the launch of an exhibition and publication at the CCA entitled, It's All Happening Too Fast, A, a Counter History of, modern of the Modern Canadian Environment, which is still up now for, uh, for, a, few days. for a few days longer. But, um, but uh, we are now proceeding with partnerships on research and exhibitions with the CCA and this show, It's All Happening Too Fast, uh, the exhibition, will be mounted here at the University of Toronto, uh, the Art Museum, uh, in May. Uh, it's a great exhibition. Uh, these are great themes for Canada's 150th and beyond uh, celebration. And so while tonight was supposed to be the close of our programming season this year, we'll be having some pop-up events related to this exhibition, including an event featuring a number of our faculty entitled Future Environments, Art and Architecture in Action. And tickets will go on sale for that soon. I should also mention that for next year, uh, we're expecting, we're especially excited to be uh, hosting and mounting events in our new building at One Spadina Crescent. So before I give a short introduction to tonight's event, I want uh, to have Mirko say a few words, but I want to also uh, thank again our friends at Herman Miller for providing the furnishings for tonight's stage uh, and for tonight's discussion. We always appreciate the opportunity to showcase Herman Miller's award-winning design and for their support of our public programming. So, Mirko. Okay. So, uh, thank you again. Uh, thanks for being here tonight. Uh, and I have the kind of um, task to summarize for the uh, people that were not yesterday in Montreal a little bit uh, the two, three points that emerge from the discussion that could be nice to connect uh, to the uh, conversation that will happen uh, uh, tonight. So for the people that were yesterday in Montreal and for Kenneth, please apologize because I'm sure that my report will be uh, uh, very imperfect. But uh, I have to say that uh, the discussion yesterday in Montreal was about uh, the idea, can there be a global architectural history today? And it was coming from the discussion that we had with Kenneth then, uh, speaking of his archive and his work, he said, well, you know, I'm doing a, a new edition of my book, Modern Architecture, Critical History, and uh, it will be the four, fifth, fourth edition? Fifth? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I would like uh, to look at other kind of uh, um, architectural uh, investigation in other countries, in other situations, in other cultures, considering Asia, Africa, and so on. So we had a conversation in which uh, Kenneth uh, presented a kind of intellectual autobiography, explaining the point of view that he has uh, and he had when he was writing his book. There was um, uh, Ezra Akan that introduced uh, the idea of a translation. Um, starting from her work on uh, Turkey, Germany, and uh, the idea of a house uh, and the translation of this idea and the Sidlugan between the two cultural countries, advocating for a greater awareness uh, in this kind of transportation of architecture among different cultures. And uh, there was Mark Jarbonzek that uh, raised the issues of the necessity to build uh, a larger, 
knowledge around this kind of global architecture. So uh, addressing uh, issues coming from different kind of uh, countries and region that uh, have been ignored until now. So more or less, uh, and apologies for my uh, totally imperfect uh, summary, that was the kind of conversation that happened yesterday in, in Montreal. So I just, um, this conversation was possible also because uh, of uh, two things that uh, I would like to thank again uh, Kenneth Frampton for the confidence that he had in CCA when he donated his archive to the, to the CCA and uh, to the uh, group uh, of uh, donors, 29 uh, people that uh, in Canada they contributed uh, with their gifts uh, to uh, create a fund for the treatment uh, of this archive. And the fact that we are having this conversation yesterday in Montreal today here, the fact that we'll be in, a, in the end of May a small uh, exhibition on, uh, on the part of the, using part of the archive of Kenneth uh, on his role as um, uh, educators is uh, the result of their contribution. And uh, uh, thanks to all of uh, uh, these people that some of them are here tonight and uh, thanks also to uh, the work with uh, the Richard Sommer and University of Toronto that makes possible this kind of exchange between these two institutions. So, Richard, you, up Mary. to you. <laughs> and now I disappear. <laughs> and. and I'm going to disappear uh, soon too. Um, but I wanted to introduce tonight's theme ju just briefly, where is the critical voice in architecture today? The romantic German philosopher Friedrich Schlegel once famously said, the historian is a prophet looking backwards, which is actually a very beautiful way to say that by casting a critical eye on and reframing the past, the historian not only illuminates our present circumstances, but open up, opens up new possibilities for the future. So we have assembled four scholars and critics tonight, Kenneth Frampton from Columbia, Keller Eastring and Craig Buckley from Yale University, and actually our own John Harwood serving uh, as the moderator. The work of each of these scholars is unique, but they also represent three recent generations, more or less, that have gone a long way to recast our understanding of architecture. Now, last night's conversation or the discussions and presentations at CCA were so provocative um, that I actually amended, actually even, uh, even shortened my, um, uh, my comments and the, the frame I want to present tonight a little bit. Referring to how Kenneth Frampton's book, Modern Architecture, A Critical History, represented a watershed moment when it was first published in 1980, Mark Yarzenbach claimed that the study and teaching of architectural history as we know it today only started in the 1980s and was spurred by figures like Ken Frampton and Rainer Banham. Now, as a young architect, on a personal level, as a young architecture student, uh, Frampton's book came out, I think, a few months before I started school, and it was the first book, serious book on modern architecture that I read, so uh, I guess my peers and I thought that architecture was always, always critical, but it turns out maybe it wasn't. Um, but we're gonna hear more about that tonight. But Kenneth Frampton um, actually has kidded us that the questions that framed last night's uh, and tonight's events are impossible to answer. He also uh, expressed some regret last night at the inability to engage in meaningful debate and discussion within our schools of architecture and how this might be one of the unfortunate consequences of the onslaught of data and information and the speed with which images and forms can be uh, uh, accessed, processed, and consumed today. So he reminds us how we might not be taking the time to think and struggle with each other about what is important for us to study and design. There is no doubt in my mind that as the world becomes more and more available to us digitally, and through, uh, for, for those of us that have the privilege through ease of travel, and the more and more we have to see and process that having critical voices 
that can challenge and sometimes decipher the world of architecture becomes more, not less, important. Um, becomes more, not less important. For a school like ours, curating the world, providing the right guideposts, and developing critical acumen has to remain central. So Ken, my hope tonight is, or I, hope, I think our hope, is that we can go some small way to answer our question, because the critical voices for our field have to be cultivated at times in places like this. Finally, I just want to tell all of you, it's a testament to the influence and stature of Kenneth Frampton and our other speakers tonight, that this event sold out actually in less than two hours, and we could have filled a hall maybe two times or three times this size, but we couldn't find it in time. So for those of you who couldn't be here, we're streaming tonight's evening lecture via Facebook Live. So a warm welcome to uh, everyone who might be watching us uh, from afar. And I also want to say this evening's event is being recorded, and along with last night's event at the CCA in Montreal, will be edited and uploaded to uh, both our respective YouTube pages in the coming weeks. So with that, um, what is the drill, John? Where are you, John Harwood? You're going to introduce the speakers and uh, enjoy. Uh, hi, I'm John. Uh, I'm new here, uh, but it's such a treat to be able to introduce uh, our three guests uh, tonight, um, whom I've known at various stages in my uh, a career, uh, who've been very important to me uh, personally, um, but I know that they're important to uh, each and every one of you, and that's what you're doing in this lecture hall. Uh, so I'll keep this short, and I'm also going to try to moderate in the most moderate way possible. I think uh, you can hear from me every, every week. Um, uh, here at U of T, uh, but it's uh, a rare opportunity to hear from, from them. Uh, so uh, here's my script. Um, uh, we're honored to present this evening's illustrious speakers. Uh, Craig Buckley uh, is an assistant professor of art history at Yale University, whose research fo uh, interests focus on the history of modern architecture and the experiments of the historical avant-gardes, the publishing and media, media practices of architects, and the relationships between artistic and architectural movements throughout the 20th century. It says center, but I corrected it. Um, <laughs> Keller, Easter, Keller Easterling uh, is also at Yale, uh, a professor at the Yale School of Architecture uh, and an architect and writer. Um, uh, her most recent book, Extra Statecraft, uh, The Power of Infrastructure Space, which it was my sincere pleasure to review for Art Forum, uh, examines global infrastructure as a medium of polity. Other books include Subtraction, which considers building removal or how to put the development industry into reverse, Enduring Innocence, Global Architecture and Its Political Masquerades, which has been a fixture in uh, seminars here at U of T uh, for many years now, and Organization Space, Landscapes, Highways, and Houses in America. And then finally, uh, it seems rather redundant to introduce Ken, uh, but uh, Kenneth Frampton is the Ware Professor of Architecture at Columbia GSAP, where he's taught since 1972. He was trained as an architect at the Architectural Association School of Architecture, London, and has worked as an architect and as an architectural historian and critic. The author of numerous seminal publications, he's currently at work on an expanded fifth edition of Modern Architecture, A Critical History, as you heard. Um, so I hope you will uh, join me uh, in offering a warm Toronto welcome to our uh, three guests, um, and we'll get on with the show with the remarks of Craig Buckley. Thank you, John, for that warm uh, introduction, and thank you to Dean Summer for the invitation. It's an incredible privilege uh, to be here with you tonight in, in the company of Keller and Ken. We've been asked to be very, very short tonight, uh, and so I will uh, try to be as short as possible, but also to take on, as, as Ken said, an impossible question. So that's a very uh, difficult task. Uh, and I want to take it up tonight uh, by s focusing on two different parts of this question. My remarks are coming from the perspective of somebody who's working primarily as a historian uh, and has worked as an editor. And it's through a historical lens that I want to uh, approach the question of what is the role of the editor and the critic in the present. The first question that I want to ask tonight is about what we understand by the term 
media and the relationship between editing and criticism. The second question I want to ask about is about critique. The prompt for tonight's conversation that we all received spoke about the fatigue and exhaustion associated with mediatization and festivalization. Yet some of the most galvanizing debates of the last decade have centered not on the exhaustion of media nor of festivals, these seem to advance in fact rather tirelessly, but of critique, which has been charged with being drained and in fact incapable of advancing a constructive agenda in the present. I wanted to begin by looking at uh, these objects here, not because I think they're necessarily exemplary instances of critique, but because they're things that have forced me to think about the relationship between criticism and media. They're pages which have been created for little magazines published during the 1960s, and it's material that I've been looking at for a book that I am just completing. To make pages like these, editing meant assembling photomechanical media. Architects worked not only with the written word, but actively sought out, collected, cut, and reassembled photographs, drawings, diagrams, clippings, and other graphic materials into new configurations. The editor acted as a monteur, that is to say, they treated photomechanical materials as elements of a kind of structure to put together and juxtapose in very particular ways. The avant-garde legacies of collage and montage were increasingly folded into a broad spectrum of visualization and publishing practices in architecture during the 1950s and 60s, creating new kinds of pages that in turn called for new ways of reading. That was true at a technical level, as many of the magazines were made physically uh, by means of cutting, collecting, and arranging media materials on the surface of a cardboard paste-up. And you're looking here at an example of a series of those paste-ups. These rarely, in fact, survive. Uh, they were often thrown out. But when they do survive, they're often very illuminating. And I hope there's uh, many of these in uh, Kenneth's archive at the CCA for future historians to work through. Such a practice of cutting and reassembling paper was closely connected, I want to insist, to arguments that sought to critically appropriate materials, technologies, and media from beyond the normal purview of architectural practice, as well as histories and concepts that had the capacity to reorient and challenge the discipline's self-image. Such practices of physical and intellectual assembly were also situated amid a larger media technological shift. The later 1950s and early 1960s were a moment in which small automated offset lithography presses were transforming how pages were reproduced, who could design and print them, and thus how print as media was being considered. It was another moment of rather radical media transformation, not unlike our own. Such a changed ethos of assembly did not only fuel the move, uh, not only fuel the more mercurial self-published little magazines of the type which I uh, just showed you, they also supported a broad range of, uh, of um, alternative and oppositional positions within architectural culture. It was partly out of such a media practice and a media condition that the capacity to redefine more dominant commercial periodicals emerged. That, I think, was the case with architectural design during the 1950s and 1960s, a magazine that Theo Crosby, uh, technical editor under Monica Pigeon, shifted from a journal of the building industry to become a dynamic platform for architecture and cultural criticism. And it's a journal that uh, Ken knows intimately since he renovated it with an even sharper critical thrust between 1961 and 1965. And you're looking at covers here that he designed uh, when he was in fact editing the journal. All of which is to suggest that the problem of media is always as much, if not more, about active assembly than it is about passive mediatization a term that insinuates media as a culprit, that is, something separate from architecture and which afflicts it from the outside. Processes of media assembly provide central, if not always well-recognized, bits of evidence about the media technological condition within and against with intellectual production and debate in the field of architecture operates. I want to sit situate this question about assembly in relationship to what I see as, as the two broad approaches for thinking about media within the field at present. The first and most familiar stresses media as a problem of mass reproducibility, and it's been central to traditions of critical theory, from the pivot, uh, from, uh, traditions of critical theory from the pivotal writings of Walter Benjamin to the Frankfurt School more broadly. The key questions concern the nature and consequences of transforming something that was, if not unique, at least ontologically distinct from photomechanical processing into a set of unlimited copies, a work of art, a building, a detail, a drawing, 
a model, or an urban plan are transformed by being made reproducible and broadcast via newspapers, journals, magazines, or transmitted on film, via television, or today circulated via blogs, tweets, Instagram feeds, and other forms of media aggregation. For a generation that witnessed the crucial role that photography, radio, and film played in the rise of fascism, analysis understandably hinged on the authoritarian effects produced by mass media, even when these were not directly mobilized by dictatorial regimes. The result was a type of critique that aimed to dismantle the structure of myth, to make conscious critical distortion, or to recognize the effects of fetishization. And in the more optimistic moments of such criticisms uh, in the writings of these thinkers, it was possible even to envision sometimes how processes of media transmission might be put to different kinds of use. A significant challenge to this way of thinking about media in terms of the effects of reproducibility has emerged out of German media theory over the last two to three decades. And this is something that's had a strong uh, influence in, in the short time that I've actually been uh, working on architecture and media. A range of approaches associated with figures like Friedrich Kittler, Bernard Siegert, or Cornelia Wissmann have insisted that the question of media shift from the nature and effect of reproducibility in newspapers, magazines, and other forms of mass media to consider the workings of the underlying cultural technologies and media infrastru infrastructures on which these depend. And since we're here in Toronto and, of course, in, uh, in his town hall tonight, it's important and worth noting that this new school of German media theory uh, depends very heavily on the work that was pioneered here by Harold Innes and Marshall McLuhan uh, during the 1950s and 1960s. Summarizing roughly, two key shifts emerge. First, a much wider range of things are understood as media, not only photography and film, but the paper used by bureaucracies, the various grid systems used in mapping and drawing, typewriters as mechanisms of literary production, telephone compression and the definition of noise, computer coding and the structuring of interfaces, uh, automated door systems, and the articulation of architectural boundaries, to name only a few. Second, this more technical approach to, uh, to media changes the position of media. Culture is not an intact expression that is then reproduced by media, Rather, cultural distinctions are seen to be articulated out of the basic media technical systems on which they fundamentally depend, even if those uh, fundamental systems are always shifting uh, like a kind of sandy floor of the desert. These very different ways of understanding media, I think, invite two very different questions about the role of the critic or the editor. The location of critique has shifted. In the former, it was applied to the conceptions uh, in the architect's or the editor's mind the role of ideology relative to the work of editors and their reading public. The second approach to media looks to the technical operations underlying these kinds of messages, those systems, standards, and infrastructures whose operations are not necessarily guided by ideology or by minds, but whose operations nonetheless produce dramatic effects within the world. This latter mode of thinking media has been in the ascendant in the past decade and in loose alliance with what could be called a post-humanist turn in the humanities, uh, the rise of perspectives drawn from science and technology studies, such as actor network theory. It's from such positions that the most significant criticism of critique has in fact been fired in the last decade. In his well-known 2004 text, Has Critique Run Out of Steam?, Bruno Latour aimed to outline what he called a realist alternative to forms of critique that were premised either on dismantling false constructions or the capacity to see through false beliefs, which he associates with the Frankfurt School tradition. This assertion was motivated in part by a concern that climate deniers were mobilizing claims about the social construction of facts, key analysis of which Latour himself had developed, as the best means for undermining scientific consensus about climate change and thus thwarting political action. Consequently, Latour suggested a different model of critique, one that did not, quote, debunk, but rather assemble. The critic, he continued, is not the one who lifts the rug out from under the feet of naive believers, but one who offers participants an arena in which to gather. There's much that is engaging about such an appeal to assembly. Certainly a more empirical retracing of the networks of people, institutions, and media that are, to paraphrase Latour, gathered together in things in which sustain their existence would help advance a critical account of media technical systems that do not so much stand outside architectural practice and render it reproducible, 
but are often the systems on which architectural practice depends, and in many cases has depended for quite a long time. Yet the imperative that critique will reorient itself around, quote, a whole new set of positive metaphors, as Latour asks, is not without its own risks. In a time when political tactics have intensified their reliance on the systematic dissemination of alternative facts within the feedback loops of an ever-shortening news cycle, we might need to make more room, uh, more space, that is, within this crowded assembly of positive metaphors for forms of opposition and refusal. It is worth critically rethinking how the authoritarian tendencies identified so long ago by Benjamin and Adorno and others have persisted and mutated, and to ask how they operate today within a media ecology that is both more distributed, but also more polarized and in, in many ways monopolized than ever. Nor perhaps were debunking and demystification ever a sufficient description of critique. Critique necessarily tarries with the negative, yet to do so also depends on a certain generosity, demanding close looking, time, and attention, qualities that are increasingly in short supply. Thank you. Many thanks for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Can you hear me all right? Yeah? <laughs> well, I want to say something very simple. Um, Architecture culture is very well rehearsed at some habitual critical stances. But we might ask whether they are information rich or information poor. You know, we're, we're really good at, at sitting up at panel discussions, at skirted tables, um, sometimes for a kind of criticality that feels like obligation or consensus, and, and the proceedings fill up uh, publications that, while not read, are nevertheless carried off under the arm of a small number of enthusiasts or, or gently placed in hotel waste baskets. But this, this critical voice seems to circulate compatible information in a, in a closed loop. Um, and while maybe harmless enough, it's information poor. But criticality as a fight or binary face-off may be equally information poor. We're really good at this one, too. There's no ideation without debate or litigious argument, we think. The avant-garde of ideas, like an avant-garde of combat, wipes away the incumbent to establish the new and transcendent. Information can only be successive rather than coexistent. And we can even laughingly report that one recent architectural rebellion in the teacup called itself the post-critical. It was a fight of one generation to be free of the previous generation's philosophically, semantically inflected theory in order to be free of, as they said, to be free to just make things. Um, and that binary often comes with its own protective loop. Architecture culture surrounds itself with special critical languages or incantations, sometimes so complex that they provide a kind of liturgical insulation against critique, ironically. Um, for instance, now as as global political issues are increasingly the subject of architectural conversations, global political thinkers are invited in to critique or almost scold architecture culture, but only as a kind of inoculation <laughs> against uh, the a small dose, um, an inoculation against the political engagement that seems sometimes so impossible. And this oscillation between loop and binary is the perennial symptom of the desire to be right, that fatal error of the homo sapien mind. The new right answer kills the old right answer and grants itself the comforting power to exclude contradiction. And, and whether talking about group behavior in architecture or global politics, whether talking about 
the form, a form, some form of intellectual sparring or all out war. This is sort of the perfection of being information poor. But there's a critical voice in architecture that's arguably very information rich um, because it's in a different register or key or part of speech. And it's so obvious or meta that it often goes unexpressed. It's not generational. Uh, it, it, it's not the critical voice of architecture today as opposed to yesterday. That's just another, another binary opposition that erases information. It, it's a voice or approach that does bring historians and designers into perhaps some unexpected collaborations. Of course, there's a strong tradition in architecture for a kind of connoisseurship of the object, uh, for giving uh, declarative names to shapes and outlines, for gathering evidence almost like legal precedent and comparing buildings in relation to other buildings or the careers of other architects. But among so many historians and thinkers, including all of those with whom I have the pleasure of speaking this evening, um, there's a capacity to transpose critique from the declarative or nominative to the infinitive. They position their critical history theory commentary within a cultural matrix that leads on to the social, to technologies and institutions of governance related to war, environment, communications, informatics, politics. So beyond the connoisseurship of the object, they tell us about aesthetic practices, shape and outline as the trace of an activity. Beyond what's depicted, they are telling us about what is enacted or with the tip of the hat to Gilbert Ryle. It's not about knowing that, knowing the right answer, but also knowing how. It's not about the determinacy of form or its naming, but about its delta or how it changes. And of course, this is work nourished by Foucault's dispositif or Agamben's family of words, dispositif, dispositive, disposition, all of which are suggestive of an active matrix or economy of pieces. We're nourished by Latour, who, unlike the post-critical, isn't turning away from the critical, but rather repositioning and recharging it with additional responsibilities. You know, for instance, in, in saying that, that the critical is less about fact and more about concern, and he's expanding the pool of information to include not only declaration, but association. What constitutes evidence is not a steady state, not a righteous binary looping adherence to an ideology or supposition. It's always about admitting what Ranciere might call the inadmissible evidence. And, and that's the thrilling moment of criticality when the loop never closes. And, and this might be a willful reading, this reading of shift from object to matrix, or this sense of uh, collaboration uh, uh, on the same scaffold with some historians and thinkers. It might be a, a willful reading since um, as designers and design teachers, we are working on form making in another key or register or gear, active form as well as object form as the means to adjusting the disposition or wiring, even the political temperament of organizations at the scale of buildings, at the scale of landscapes, at the scale of territories. And, and we pursue that approach because it has different aesthetic and political capacities that may even make it easier to outwit stealthy global power, what I study. Um, uh, knowing that in the world that I study, being right is way too weak. Um, it does, doesn't have enough information, it, and it won't help you against strong men and uh, the orange-tinted one um, who, who knows how to make Teflon out of lies. This, this is work that's information-hungry. 
hungry for historical and contemporary inadmissible evidence. Designers are trying to think less like a utopian who, who knows the one and only thing to do and more like a pool player who knows what to do next or how to play for longer and add more information to the table, how to shape global agreements, not only as master plan declarations or standard policy solutions, but as bargains, chain reactions, or ratchets, protocols of interplay between spatial variables that remain in play to respond to the moment when they're outmaneuvered. And some of the aesthetic practices are even a little bit like the English or the spin that you put on the ball in pool. So far from an obstruction to making, this is the criticality, the criticality from, from which I've learned so much from the, from the others that we're hearing tonight. Um, far from an obstruction to making, this is the criticality necessarily precisely at the moment of making something. These are two uh, contributions which are not easy to follow, and uh, I had, I suppose, my own uh, yes, my own uh, idea about what I might contribute to this impossible question. Um, I suppose the first is the fact that we, in a strict sense, one doesn't have critics of architecture anymore. I think anywhere perhaps, um, as we have critics of music, critics of literature, critics of theater, et cetera, et cetera. It has always been something of a problem, but now I think it, it's, uh, it, it's also to almost totally absent. And I, I recall you know, various people at various times you know, did in fact write regular uh, columns in, in um, respected standard newspapers like Stanislas von Moos, Bruno Zevi, uh, um, someone named, uh, from the dim and distant past, Robert Fernand Jordan, uh, Francois Chalin, more of another generation entirely, Paul Goldberger, of course, the illustrious Ada Louise Huxtable, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, most of these uh, figures have, uh, well, they're no longer, some of them are no longer alive, and others uh, uh, have, have long since ceased to publish in the, in the newspapers. And um, so that's uh, about voices, I mean, I think that those voices are decidedly absent. The other thing that I um, was going to say and I talked about last night is this question about rise and fall of culture. And, uh, and the two, uh, two previous speakers made me think all, all over again about, um, well, this question of what is criticism and uh, um, and is criticism, you know, by implication, always negative criticism. Uh, I, I think criticism is negative criticism, just solely negative criticism, is somewhat uh, simple-minded, simplistic, uh, bordering on the barbaric, really, you know. That, and, and if I understood correctly, uh, Craig Buck, Buckley's reference to Latour, and uh, I I'm, I'm have to confess I'm not f familiar much with the writings of Latour, which I don't find that accessible, I must say, not to myself. Uh, but this, this idea that, uh, uh, that a different kind of criticism should be promulgated, you know, that in fact it, it comes closer to an appraisal than to uh, criticism. And I, I often feel about, uh, well, where I have sometimes written criticism, that, um, that in a way, in the end, uh, the act is more one of appraisal than than uh, something that's uh, totally negative. In fact, I don't write uh, if I really uh, feel very uh, antipathetic to what is being posited. I simply don't uh, speak about it at all, you know. I, I'd rather, I don't have anything to say about it. I don't particularly uh, relish the idea of a kind of negative, ad adopting any kind of negative attack. I don't see the point you know, 
at least when it comes to cultural works, I mean, uh, anyway, works of architecture, let's say even more specifically. And um, Keller made me think about these lines from T.S. Eliot, which I've always liked very much, and I think ought to be put, I mean, you know, in the old days, of course, in the very old days, in the dim and distant past of classicism, one inscribed uh, improving legends on the exteriors of schools of architecture or even on uh, graduating certificates, as in the case of um, Carlos Scarpa, who put on to the certificate when he became director of a school in Venice the words of Gian Battista Vico, verum ipsum factum, you know, which was, of course, against Cartesianism, you know, uh, and uh, um, was, was placed a greater emphasis upon, uh, well, the truth being made as opposed to uh, rising out of uh, uh, unremitting, uh, well, un unremitting empirical exper experiments in, re in relation to nature. Uh, uh, well, as opposed to the split between appearance and being, which is so much part of the Descartes uh, position, and also of the scientific um, triumphant uh, mode of uh, thought, which um, prevails, of course, even more forcefully than ever before. And, and with, you know, um, in the sense of applied science, with very disconcerting and rather in many cases, um, upsetting consequences, you know. Um, I'm reminded of Baudrillard's line, everything works but nothing does, you know, vis-a-vis, -vis, of course, the triumph of uh, Western technology. But uh, Keller's uh, made me think of these lines of Eliot's that I think could be taken as a, as a Yes, there's something to be addressed to critics and also to architects, you know. I, find, I think it, it goes something like this. What there is to achieve has already been achieved once or twice or several times by men one cannot hope to emulate. Of course, you could object to the use of men, but we won't go there. But there is no competition, it goes on. There is only the struggle to achieve what has been found and lost and lost and found again and now under conditions which seem unpropitious. I mean, I think, you know, that, that's where we are in many ways uh, with architecture who are in some sense, uh, uh, one often feels has a very anachronistic aspect, you know? And, um, well, I could, I suppose, go on far too long and, uh, and, uh, with increasing incoherence, but uh, um, uh, yes, I, I well, this I don't think you can really uh, develop a kind of critical attitude towards anything or towards architecture without um, you know developing a position not only in relation to architecture but in relation to uh, the life world in general and. Uh, um, and in that regard, I mean, the, the paradox is that, or for me anyway, that the United States, my, my coming to the United States in the mid-60s had, had the effect of politicizing me in a way. Or maybe, perhaps better to say, you know, to recognize for the first time what the power of capitalism, you know, actually is. And um, it coincided with reading Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition, which is a book I shall never recover from, and um, for, for insights into uh, architecture, but also into architecture and building, and also into the difference between architecture and building, which I think is something that you know, should be par part of, uh, of the formation of any architect, really. And, I, and I'll end with a funny story, which is, vis-a-vis -vis this question of the difference between architecture and building, is that when Renzo Piano went to his uh, rather successful builder father and said he wanted to study architecture, the father said, what do you want to do that for? We know how to build. You can learn through us. We don't have to go to architecture school, you know. Well, there we are. Okay. <laughs>
it's a little loud. Well, thank you, all, all three of you, for really um, outstanding, thoughtful, careful, but also provocative statements, I think. Um, and I have, you know, the typical failure of the moderator, which I will emulate uh, again tonight, is to prepare questions and then have them answered and then have uh, to improvise. So um, I had intended to ask each of you uh, not only the question that obviously serves as the title of, of, of this gathering, uh, you know, where is the voice? Obviously, it's right here, so stop looking. Um, but uh, what the kinds of imperatives that we're, we need to be working under in a contemporary moment, and I think we've gotten three very articulate visions of, of how to proceed with critical practice across um, uh, media, as, as Craig uh, stressed, um, uh, very cautiously and um, strategically, uh, thinking through uh, multimedia uh, practice and architecture, not just in history writing, but in terms of editorial practice, in terms of producing the imagery and the forms that we need to make. Um, and I, I think that uh, Keller's um, uh, efforts to encourage us to move away from a, a series of binaries that may structure critical thought and have structured it for a long time uh, and, and uh, maybe engage more in a bit of a war of position with, with this tactically um, to, to stay moving, uh, to surrender this rightness, um, also offers us a really interesting kind of signpost in terms of the direction of our practice. Um, and then, uh, obviously, um, Ken, you left us with several riddles <laughs> there um, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, really a wonderful set of associations. But um, uh, the, uh, the question that you ask about the absence of the critic uh, in the kind of comfortable institutional framework, whether it's the newspaper or the architectural journal, um, uh, today we would also point, obviously, to uh, various uh, institutions that have emerged as a response to the internet um, uh, and its uh, manifold consequences um, uh, is, I think, a really interesting one because one can talk about that absence and also see it um, as a kind of proliferation of, of critical practices uh, which are no longer located inside of the bodies of um, uh, individuals who therefore serve as this kind of translating machine uh, working across boundaries. So, so if we have that, that question uh, tackled <laughs> uh, to start off, uh, then I, I think we can maybe press ahead into some other ones. And one of the leitmotifs that I, um, we had an opportunity to discuss briefly before this event and um, came out even more uh, in, in clear focus as a result of hearing um, our guests' remarks tonight uh, is that uh, there is a need right now uh, to aggressively re-theorize the business of criticism as not being a question of judgment, either in a disinterested Kantian sense or in a kind of more strictly juridical sense, um, but rather uh, one of uh, uh, reorienting or making the case for reorienting ourselves in relation to this word. Uh, criticism, of course, means to explain, uh, to account for, uh, to explicate. Um, uh, and moreover, in, in ancient Greek and uh, you know, all the way up through the, the 20th century, um, uh, uh, meant that it was an act of working across a boundary of knowledge. Um, uh, so you criticize something because the person you're speaking to knows less about it or knows it in a different way than you know it. And, and the critics tries to straddle that gap and, and communicate over that gap. And I think each of you guys have, have, have expressed um, uh, really interesting approaches to trying to, to, to tackle that problem. So I guess what I would like to ask as a, as a sort of kickoff question, and if you don't like it, we can always move on to the next one, say pass, um, uh, would be to, to say, in your view, where do you locate these boundaries between those who know in a way that uh, um, uh, architects and the related d design disciplines and the adjuncts, you know, uh, figures like us who serve as historians as well are, and the audience that we ought to communicate to. Where do you see that line? Um, what kinds of uh, media, what kinds of institutions, et cetera, um, are forming that boundary um, uh, that, that the critic must need straddle? Um, and then how best to 
do the work of straddling that boundary, um, trying to build the connection, and maybe starting from there. It's kind of a general and open question. Uh-oh. Well, I mean, some of this is, has to do with education in general, I think. Um, the level of education in a society, uh, and, and particularly in this moment of history when the speed of change is so rapid and, uh, and the... Um, well, in, in many ways, the functioning of democracy in a, a middle-class bourgeois parliamentary sense is in a um, certain state of disarray, I think, you know, probably increasing disarray. And, and uh, it's, it's possible to argue, I think, particularly in the North American, I mean, the United States, that there is a kind of um, dumbing down of the population which has been institutionalized, basically. In many ways, of course, through the media itself, and uh, and and if the um, you know, if, if the if the question of uh, people understanding you know a, a um, people's understanding of reality, I mean, if that question can't be clarified, you know, at the level of uh, of the political, then it's very hard to make uh, to. to position the cultural in relation to it, I think, you know, particularly environmental culture, architecture, et cetera, et cetera. It's very hard to uh, communicate, I think, at, at a really accessible level to the society at large if, if that society is so undeveloped, you know, or you could say um, distorted by by the lack of education and by media mediatic manip manipulation, so that you, you can't even find the ground with which with which to begin the discussion. I think, I think that's a, you know a fu fundamental problem, at least for architecture or environmental. So then, th there's a kind of situation of a superstructure without a base, right? But I took you, Craig, to be saying something a, a bit different in. in uh, countering the Adornian position and the Latourian position in, in your remarks, and obviously, Keller, you spoke to this too, um, uh, with a bit of a different view. Um, so could you kind of jump in there? Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, th I think first it has to be uh, affirmed that there is absolutely a, a shredding of anything like a kind of common frame of reference, if a common frame of reference ever did exist, uh, and that has been accelerated in, in the recent years. and. It's not for nothing that uh, we're speaking about the political shadow coming from the United States looming over us, associated with that kind of loss of frame of reference. Uh, most of the figures associated with Trump's rise are incredibly media, media savvy, ran various forms of media platforms uh, for, for years before arriving uh, in his uh, extended entourage. But at the same time, I think uh, there is a tremendous opportunity at the moment to uh, think media otherwise, uh, and not only to think of it in terms of manipulation. And I loved, I loved Keller's suggestion about a, a kind of information-rich critique. And I think one of the ways in which uh, media can be thought, both in terms of the, the call to assembly that Latour puts on the table as a critical mode of, of thinking, and I do affirm that, that side of Latour. I actually think it's quite... Uh, important to think about the ways in which matters of concern can assemble the constituencies uh, around particular objects, around particular problematic features, uh, problematic aspects of the life world in the present. Um, but how that happens when the objects of concern are not ones that draw us to them um, through our, our particular investment in them, but through our disinvestment or our, or our opposition, I think is a is a much more difficult task, particularly at a moment uh, like the one we're in, in which things are so starkly polarized. Uh, and the polarization is, is um, in fact, one of the products of, I think, the splintering of any kind of common frame of reference. So it's kind of a roundabout way of getting, getting to uh, the answer. But I, I, I think, certainly, I'd like to see uh, an effort 
to continue the tradition of thinking about media as a form of making. Uh, and I was happy to see that in, in Keller's position and that this uh, approach to media sh should not really be thought only in terms of uh, a manipulation coming from the outside, but really as a practice that architects have been involved in for a very long time and that in fact some of the media practices that architects engage in are precisely those forms of assembly in which wider constituencies can develop. And those might not be constituencies that would develop around the traditional voice of the critic and the expertise associated with criticism. They may be around other forms of knowing and other forms of making. Uh, I, d I definitely want to take up that question. You've already anticipated something I, I, I wanted to, to ask. Uh, but I, I, um, especially Keller, since you are someone uh, who has such expertise in uh, drawing us towards uh, what, what Craig was just talking about as, as those things that we are disinvested in as, as architects and, and, and calling us to look at the horrors that uh, are um, you know, beyond the landing page of the International Standards Organization or something like that. Maybe you could speak to that critical role of drawing that kind of attention and building a kind of uh, a consensus of attention maybe about needing to, to, to address the, these objects. You, you asked, you know, what, what are the institutions that you have to try to straddle? What's the voice that you, you know, that, that you need to, to reach beyond? And now I'm, you know, trying to, in, in, in global political circles, raise the status of spatial variables. You know, it, it, in, you know, it doesn't matter how ineffectual or unimaginative the technical languages of law or informatics or global standards or UNHCR protocols, it does, doesn't matter. The, the authority that they have is uh, sort of very firm. Um, so the, the, the trick for me is to try to, to um, express another authority, another status for spatial practices. And that, that's what, in a way, what I meant when when talking about a real gratitude to you know feeling that I'm working on the same scaffold with historians like you and in the tradition that Ken has set up and historians like you or Felicity Scott or Lucia Ale or I mean you know there's a there there are many people whose work is leading on with staggering detail and a fidelity to evidence over ideology that is incredibly helpful in in the work that that I'm trying to do. Um. Uh, That's very kind of you to say and um, uh, I, I always flatter to get listed uh, next to uh, people uh, that you just mentioned um, and to be sitting on a stage with you guys uh, as well. Um, the I don't want to worry any one particular question uh, too, too far because we have there's there's too many uh, that have been opened up here. Uh, so without closing it down, we can always return to that question. Uh, I, I would like at the end of our discussion maybe to circle back around since we are in an auditorium that has so many students in it uh, to hear your thoughts about the role of the critical mindset in teaching. Um, but maybe we'll we'll come back to that later. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, uh, um, because we are so often mistaking uh, frame and content, uh, we are so often uh, sort of befuddled by an inherited language that comes out of um, an art historical discourse surrounding the object, and, and Keller, you spoke to this very directly um, uh, in, in your remarks. Um, I wanted to ask you guys about the media of criticism. Uh, so if we're going to be doing this work of straddling, explaining, uh, analyzing, uh, if we're going to try to identify um, objects or, or matrices of concern, um, uh, not only do we have the problem of what to consider, um, whom to consider, but in what medium. And one of the things that I think has drawn such a you know uh, interested audience today is that all of you have worked very vigorously across media. I mean, you mentioned straight out, um, uh, Craig, that it's uh, through a kind of uh, concern with uh, working 
as an editor and a writer, as 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 a, as a designer, and 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 uh, and trying to to work across those those boundaries, um, and you know, obviously, in curating exhibitions, uh, editing, you know, something like AD, which looms large behind us, and obviously is, is such a, a a monument to uh, the uh, early stages of your career, Ken. Um, uh, you guys have made strategic and tactical decisions about which media uh, seem best as vehicles for for, for projects, um, uh, and you know, in some cases, you know, kind of even the mode of research, Keller, for instance, that you have, have developed, it's, it's almost as though you needed to invent that as a um, as a methodological construct and to design it mediatically um, in, in very deliberate ways. So I would be really interested to hear, and I think the audience would too, to hear um, uh, something explicit about how you think about operating, uh, selecting the, the media apparatus that seems appropriate to the kinds of work that you want to do. It's, a, it's an amazing question, and uh, it, it's a perennial question in, uh, for scholars. Uh, maybe it should be more of a question for scholars, PhD programs, that, that one cannot, uh, one has to invent the document that, that allows you to uh, pose the question that you're posing. There is no, there is no boilerplate document. Um, and... Uh, and, and it and maybe has a little bit something to do with what I was uh, trying to say about um, putting one's critical framework in another key um, or another gear, um, trying to find another way to um, um, uh, whether it's through a different kind of medium or whether it's it's through the kind of English on the ball, you know, the, that, that, that sometimes the story, the very thing you're trying to tell is embedded in the aesthetic itself. Um, I mean, I was so struck there was a, by your choice to, um, to show those covers, um, which you know, very clearly show they, they, there's, a, there's another story in the spin um, that's speaking quite loudly. Um, and not, I'm also, as I was trying to say, also quite sensitive to trying to sometimes make those documents in a way that's not declarative and that's a little bit undercover, that's active, that's moving around, that's leaving some traces, but isn't finished and can't be easily targeted. Ken, can I... Can I Press you a little bit on that, um, given that uh, of all of us, uh, you have the most experience in terms of selecting, maybe not just media but also genre. Um, uh, you know, as I think Richard uh, emphasized at the beginning, um, uh, we didn't have a critical history of modern architecture before that volume, uh, you know, appeared. Um, obviously, it didn't appear, um, you know. Uh, like Athena out of the head of Zeus, you were drawing on you know contemporaries, and that's what made the book such a, a discursive success, right? It, it plugged into a discourse that had already developed, not only in uh, the context of oppositions, but you know elsewhere. But um, at the same time, the decision to shape the the frame of that book was novel, right? And and to to, to um, say what we're talking about when we say modern architecture, it starts here, it ends there, it moves across these geographic boundaries, it, um, uh, it needs to be illustrated uh, thusly. I mean, I think um, you know, one of the things that still marks out your book and uh, one of the reasons that it, it's, it's so in use today is, is the, um, uh, the strategic choice of how to illustrate these buildings, um, the use of, of uh, the plan um, and so on. And so I was kind of wondering if you could speak a little bit to that, I mean, what 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 shapes your your decision making when it comes to uh, really pulling, as you know, as Craig was emphasizing in his in his presentation earlier, um, pulling together media into a certain uh, confluence that will get the point across. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I feel uh, you know that. Well, I have certain kind of uh, um, 
I mean, I was trained as an architect, and I also worked as an architect, so I have a kind of deformation from the start, you know, or formation, whichever way one looks at it. And, and you know, it's always both. And, and then the second thing which I hinted at in my remarks is the, the impact that the state has on me from a political point of view, but not only the state, but also, as it happens, initially Hannah Arendt, uh, but subsequent to that, of course, the Frankfurt School. So, um, in fact, Robin Middleton commissioned me to write this this history without giving it. You know, well, I was supposed to write a history of modern architecture, but he didn't. Uh, there was no the critical part was added by me, and, and uh, um, maybe slightly defensively, you know, a, a critical history, but. Um, uh, it took me 10 years to write it because I couldn't, for technical reasons, I couldn't get it down to the size they needed, but in the end that was solved. And I suppose that was also useful because it gave me well, more time and uh, more time to reflect on what do I, you know, what, what is included and what is excluded. And I was talking uh, um, last night about this question of the global history, for example, because I'm supposed to expand it. And then the issue of what to, what to be, what should be included and what should be excluded uh, arises. And, and what are the criteria for doing that? Which, of course, one could say is an issue that faces uh, also architectural criticism or, um, or perhaps criticism altogether. I mean, the, I mean, if criticism is interpretation, and uh, there is this uh, beautiful essay by E.H. Carr, What is History?, where he argues that uh, the role of the historian is to interpret the relationship between the interdependence between facts and values, and um, and and I think uh, you know you were asking me about how do, how does one in terms of the media how does one make choices about uh, which images to use or whether in that book in particular whether you use a line drawing or a photograph, and uh, um, in many cases I use line drawings because they can carry information you know, and be reduced to a small size and still carry information, whereas you, when you bring a photograph down to that small dimension, you, you lose the information completely. But it depends, of course, on the capacity of the reader to, to read the code of the, of the, you know, section or plan or whatever it is. So, and so it presupposes a certain, um, yes, yes, a certain informed reader I mean, I know I, I, I'm, I'm very happy, of course, that the book still is around and it has seen, you know, it has served the purpose that it, that it has, but of course it has these limitations of its, its rather exaggerated density and, and this question of decoding images is, arises all over again. Um, But, uh, but I think this is a little bit off the question of the wider accessibility, the, the potential wider ex accessibility of uh, any kind of critical uh, take, you know, the, the um, yeah. I think uh, it's uh, it is a great question, and it, it's one that you know, just to sort of pick up where where Ken left off, I, I so appreciate, in fact, the way in which you use drawings in your articles and in your histories, and in fact, not only use drawings but make the drawings in many cases for the for the books. I mean, the the celebrated case is the article on the Maison de Verre, in which, uh, in a sense you not only interpreted in that building, you recovered it in many respects from uh, a kind of uh, oblivion uh, that the profession had, had uh, cast it into and produced a way of looking at it through the drawings you made and through the photographs that you used. So again, the, the, the media question is central for a historian in the sense that they are both producing an interpretation and assembling the evidence, and in many cases producing the evidence, through which that interpretation can then be preceded and then shared amongst, uh, uh, one hopes, an ever-widening circle. But that ever-widening circle is harder and harder to, to enlarge. Um, in terms of the question about media in 
the writing of history today, uh, speaking to it from my own practice, certainly at the moment that we live in, the book is not the only object for the historian, yet it still remains the sine qua non of a certain kind of um, uh, ability to proceed in the world as a historian. So we live with that contradiction, and I think that should be reflected on in critical practice, that we have at our disposal a much wider array of, of operations, not only journals and books, but uh, online publishing, combinations of online publishing with uh, uh, printed publishing, exhibitions, uh, other forms of engagement uh, that are incredibly rich, yet are not always valorized within the kinds of institutions in which we work. So I think that itself represents a, a kind of critical problem today, particularly as one wants to uh, access, or invite other audiences into the architectural conversation um, through other media. In terms of how that relates to projects I've worked on, uh, on the one hand, the little magazines exhibition that I uh, took part in and helped curate at, at Princeton was a kind of shoestring operation. We really um, created an exhibition that could display magazines with almost n no budget. Uh, and the important thing was, first of all, to keep them safe, but again, to gather people around them. So the, the whole point of the exhibition was to put these uh, little magazines in public again and then to invite the people who had made them to have a conversation around them. And so what was critical about it was not necessarily making a judgment about the magazines, but in fact restoring some sense of their uh, life to a wider public. And this happened sort of now 10 years ago at a moment when Facebook was maybe a year old, uh, when uh, Instagram hadn't been invented, when uh, many people thought books were going to disappear and little magazines, certainly were or bigger magazines, were going to disappear. And what's happened in the last 10 years is, in fact, the opposite. There's been an explosion of small publishing by architects around the world. The exhibition was taken up uh, from Chile to Norway to Montreal to CCA, one of the first supporters, I should say. Uh, thank you to Mirko for that. Uh, but, uh, you know, really taken up widely. And it indicated, I think, a hunger for... Uh, a mixed regime of media, something that uses small, quick platforms, but also uses slower platforms uh, and uses sort of medium platforms like the magazine. And so that that range of options, I think, uh, is both a tremendous opportunity for historians and for cr critical historical work at the moment, uh, but also finds itself swamped within uh, what has to be described you described it so eloquently, Ken, as one of the most challenging media moments uh, in which we've, we've ever seen. Thank All right, and then let's go there, because I, I do want to actually go deeper into this. I mean, uh, each of you touched on this uh, problem. And, you know, for me, this, this question of evidence is really um, one that is the first hurdle of effective critical practice, because uh, and I don't say that because of the, and this is me interjecting, I, I promised earlier I wouldn't do that, but my own, <laughs> yeah, too late, I, I'm going there. Um, part of this is, is because I've, I've grown very irritated as a historian with the, the kind of panic over, um, and, and it's, it must be mock shock about alternative facts, right? This idea that, um, we are living through an unprecedented age of anti-truth, right? I mean, uh, you can read, I mean, a great example is Robert Park's essay, The Natural History of the Newspaper, written in 1923 about the rise of uh, the um, mass media in the United States and the ways in which um, uh, these capitalists are able to uh, break a population down into a readership and then cater to it, offer it, it the facts that it wants, having massive demographic and research operations that he, as the you know one of the founders of the Chicago School of Sociology, was actually envious of. Right, so so it's not that that uh, Facebook or or Twitter or whatever has has engendered some kind of new crisis in relation to facticity. It's not that we have a new generation of cynics who um, who reject these things at all, um, uh, but rather maybe we could tackle the question of 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 evidence in in a different way. And I think each of you have have, have already shown us in in your. Uh, published work and in your remarks, uh, something about how to do that. But I, I, I kind of wanted to draw out your attitudes towards um, evidence, how you, um, how you valorize certain forms of facts, how do you, how do you produce facticity, 
um, in, in your work um, uh, by um, selecting out from the vast slurry of things that you could be writing about, um, uh, uh, those things which are unfit uh, for our concern. Um, uh, I think that in this, there is a kind of, not just an aesthetic question, uh, and I mean aesthetic in the strict sense of the science of relation of subjects to objects, but also um, a kind of moral um, imperative to, to um, construct uh, a truth. And, and so I, I, I'm wondering if I can kind of draw each of you out a little bit further on, on that topic, because it is quite simple to say, ah, we, we can throw up our hands and say, everything is swirling around too quickly, it's, um, it's not possible to control the narrative from a position of authority like we used to be able to. My suspicion is that that's not the case at all, that, that each of you are offering us really different models for, for thinking about this. Um, for instance, in something like the Enduring Innocence book, it, it was very important to me to deliver evidence to political theory, um, to uh, drop it at the feet of political theory, because the, the evidence that I was uncovering was would, would not conforming and um, and for people who also were studying global politics as the work of rational actors and so on. Um, it, it was a pleasure to me to be able to craft a, a document which, which would allow me to write a kind of footnoted fiction. So it could be rigorous schol in a scholarly way, but it was uh, stranger than um, fiction and a way to um, also get in get in the groove of the way in which that, and I completely agree with the, the way in which the world runs from that kind of lubricated, you know, slippery fiction. Um, so kind of like get used to that and um, figure out how to work with it. Um, and it's 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 stupid and it's fictitious even when it's. In, it has at, at its disposal uh, lots of intelligence, you know, like the kind of a special stupidity that, um, that, but that that doesn't begin with Trump at all, you know, like that. This is this is an a, this is an ancient story. This is, um, but but it, but but it is political thinking and political form making in another gear because it's it, it, there is not about being right or about adhering to kind of ideology to be political. Um, um, I mean, maybe that's what my body is. <coughs> yes, well, this, this brings up for me, you know, one of the problems I think inside, uh, I, I've misspent my life in an architecture school. And, uh, um, and uh, architecture school, which gets very, very high, high quality, has always had very uh, high level students entering the school. And uh, and I suppose uh, uh, my discourse and the discourse of Mary McLeod, and we've talked uh, sort of in tandem in a way over a long period of time, um, has always involved the question of the political and architecture in relation to the political in teaching history of 20th century and 19th century, mainly both of us. And. Um, and one of the, the difficulties, I think, is to maintain uh, the morale of architecture students, actually. Because uh, what places them is uh, not, uh, not so easy to, to handle, I don't think. And particularly, I, I'll give you one example, because there are two ex-students of mine who are uh, preoccupied with housing. But as long as they remain in the United States, it's totally futile. Uh, issue totally and utterly futile, you know, and and uh, I keep on telling them to get out of here. You know, go to California, or even might be another country. But but in any case, you know, even building intelligent middle class housing is out of the question. You know, it's just out of the question, and and so it's a it's a total non-event. You know, and uh, it's really shameful. I was picking up a Spanish magazine that's just come out, and the amount of housing being built in Spain 
even in the midst of its depression, and the total incapacity of the United States to do anything at all. You know. and, and that is, uh, you know, that, that is something, I think, which is a real uh, challenge for uh, you know, someone who's been misspending his life in this particular way. You know, uh, Uh, it's, that's yeah. That's certainly not encouraging. Um, <laughs> in terms of evidence, I don't know that my evidence can compare to anything like the evidence which uh, Keller brings to light and and offers to both the discipline and to political thinking more broadly. Nor necessarily the evidence that Ken brings to light. But I'm struck and uh, again and again when I work on these small groups who've left these fragmentary traces uh, to look at. In fact, what it was they were cutting and pasting as evidence, and to think where were those things coming from? To what kind of networks of information uh, did those pieces need to circulate, and what did it take to, in fact, obtain them? Uh, and that kind of evidence, I guess, suggests a different set of questions, which is not strictly about the particular ideology that was uh, being used or which we might attribute to it, but what were the kind of practices through which various kinds of information, various kinds of technologies, various kinds of positions, in fact, uh, were able to reach people at various moments in time. And this was, in fact, quite material. Uh, it wasn't immaterial at all. Um, and so that kind of evidence, I think, is uh, uh, both tells us that media is a practice, which I think we already know, but we often need reminding, in fact, that it is a practice and that it is something that we construct together uh, and in tension with other positions. And so evidence for me always uh, somehow re allows one to retrace a particular network of actors at a moment in time and the kinds of concerns uh, that in fact link them. Um, maybe then it makes sense uh, to move on to the kind of last question that I have and then uh, maybe time permitting we can open up uh, question and answer time to our uh, brilliant audience, um, uh, but uh, I mentioned earlier to turn to this question of teaching. Um, certainly for the Daniels at, at this incredible juncture in the institution's history, moving into this new building, um, uh, adapting to um, the presence of a very large and, and vigorous undergraduate curriculum, uh, building a new doctoral program and so on, this is something that's uh, front and center for all of the, the faculty here. Um, and uh, the, the uh, wonderful uh, administrative staff that helps it helps it work, but also, of course, in the minds of the students. Um, and uh, you know, following on what you were just saying, uh, Ken, about uh, uh, making some strategic decisions about how we misspend our time <laughs> in uh, in our institution, I, I'm I'm curious about what uh, how you each handle the role of teaching critical thought teaching criticism as a sort of uh, a category of activity that, you know, in an ideal world, each and every one of your students would be able to take on and to actually um, exploit as a way of, of, of living in the world, um, uh, uh, integrate into the, the practice, and, and, and what you see as effective ways of, of encouraging that, um, uh, especially if those ways you think are, are perhaps Underrepresented in the way that architecture is taught more broadly, um, and you know, I mean, obviously, uh, Ken, with, with the uh, number of institutions that you have had uh, the opportunity to teach at, I think, I think maybe starting with you in terms of being able to move across uh, so many different national and even you know, uh, uh, sub geographic uh, divisions in, in your teaching would be really helpful. Um, a point of view for us to to get on this because. Um, you know, obviously we're, we're in this cosmopolis of Toronto, uh, we're dealing with this uh, really uh, diverse uh, student body and faculty and so on, so um, I, would, I really appreciate uh, uh, some uh, points of view from you on that. Well, I, I, um, I have certain hang-ups, as I've already mentioned, confessed to uh, Hannah. Hannah Arendt has a hang-up, but another hang-up is Clement Greenberg for his 1938 essay, avant-garde and cage, because I, uh, well, you probably know it, but I mean, basically his argument is that uh, it's a reaction, of course, to totalitarian 
uh, state culture, you know, in, uh, as it was in fascist Italy, in Nazi Germany, and the Soviet Union, and um, socialist realism, I suppose you can say, you cut the thing short. And, uh, and then his uh, unease with um, the reduction of art to mere distraction, entertainment, amusement, you know, and, uh, and the, uh, the idea of trying to ground uh, um, a practice in uh, it, its own relative autonomy. Uh, that that uh, you know, stayed with me for a long time. And uh, in 1983, when I was kind of trying to uh, yes, regroup myself about the fact that we were un unquestionably have entered into a postmodern world, and that the modern project of the modern movement was uh, no longer a viable project, um, or no, no longer believable, I suppose, is what it, that's the better way of putting it. I, I, uh, I got involved with this idea of critical regionalism, but at, uh, at a later point, I, I, I thought that um, the relative autonomy of architecture turns in the last analysis on the fact that it's constructed. And that led me into this whole sort of tectonic business, you know, into this book, Studies in Tectonic Culture, because I, I recognized that this was a field of discourse that had no, that had difficulty in finding its ground in relation to the society, you know, or in relation to itself. Even. What, what was it exactly? What was its scope? And so, uh, I, I, I would use that book, I would use that text, you know, to, in a course. Um, so it's very much, you know, in a way we are all a bit at cross purposes. I mean, it's very much, you know, I talked earlier about formation and deformation. I mean, it's very much oriented towards the, the built object. You know. And so uh, in this course, I, uh, at its best, you know, students make didactic models which are meant to not only express the technical, and not analytical, well, not analytical, the, the didactic models that are meant to express not only the techni technical uh, aspect of the work, but also its poetic, uh, the combination of the, of the technical fact and the poetic aspect of, of realizing it. And, and the, so the whole enterprise is to make students aware of that, you know. Well, as, as an example, you know, I mean, there are other games I have imposed upon students <laughs> at different times. <laughs> and, uh, but that's one, for example. I get that one. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> I gave you one question about the model. Well, you made a model, didn't you? No, the, I wrote it. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, uh, in all of the places where I've taught, uh, the library is full of the slides that Ken Frampton put there and the books that Ken Frampton somehow indirectly curated. Um, and the, the um, you know, this, this exercise with, um, uh, of, of, of modeling and, and analyzing is, um, you know, just still the one that we are doing. You know, this is what is taught, um, and uh, again, a, li a little bit what I was just kind of trying to say about that, it, that it is not a, it's not a, you know, the very act of making it, the very act of moving through those processes, the very act of understanding the tectonic and so on, that it's, it, it works against uh, the nominative uh, kind of taxonomy of an architectural form in every way. Um, and so it is this in this kind of active register, um, and some of the things that people would say about the about critical regionalism, you know, you just had to say you just do not get that. You know, you are just not understanding that this is in a different key. You know, this is in a this is in a different part of speech almost. Um, and uh, and along those lines, in m my own um, studios. Uh, you know, I mean, I think a lot of the architecture studios are 
taught as a kind of masterpiece studio. If it were drama school, it would be that you know you you're being taught to do Hamlet soliloquy. Um, but I and that's fine. Um, that you have to do that, but. Um, but I like to at least offer one chance for m my students to have the equivalent of um, an improvisation class in, in, in the theater training, you know, that you are allowed to test your reactivity to a winding set of things that are inevitably going to happen and test, test your political um, savvy. Um, so that's just one example. I, mean, I think I wanted to to go back in a sense to Ken's comment about housing and and the students uh, studying housing and being passionate about it without even having the faintest hope necessarily of being able to enact that within the current conditions in the United States and to link that to some notion of a matter of concern uh, I, I'm not sure that you can necessarily teach critical thinking but you can assemble people around what is a question of concern for us. And in fact, the discipline regularly does do that, uh, particularly the emphasis upon housing that has been at the Graduate School of Arts and Planning and Preservation for so long is a mode of preserving and, and challenging and extending a type of knowledge that does not necessarily find ready clients in the world. And so I think teaching is not simply about imparting knowledge, but also about assembling a kind of constituency around a concern, in this case housing, but a school can be a laboratory for discovering what the concerns at a particular moment are. Uh, that comes not only from the professors, but also, of course, from the students. And in, in, in my case, the other sort of key question or key part of the puzzle is to go back to this theme of time, which has come back again in each of the presentations. And school is also a clock, and it runs on a particular schedule and its schedules have various rhythms from classes to lectures to semesters to four-year programs. And anything we can do to stretch out our moments within that particular clock, I think is really important. I mean, to be able to pursue a question over more than one semester and to really examine it over a longer period of time should be an object, I think, of critical thought within the school because it really does push against the regular structure of ed education, which is always to keep us moving on to the next thing. And so in addition to using schools to find those objects of concern, we might also use schools to allow us to think about them longer rather than shorter or faster. Yeah, I, know, I, I really re respond to that because I've, I've always thought, for example, that in schools of architecture, you know, well, my experience has been one class of 12 students or something like that uh, for, for a studio design. And out of that class, at the end of the day, maybe two projects out of 12 are really promising projects. But no, then, no, but I think the important issue here is that the student grows through internalizing success. And rather than them being asked to design another project you know, on the clock, be much better that you took these two and got them to work the project to another to another level. You know, they would learn more, I think, by that than doing one more goddamn studio exercise. You know, <laughs> because it's and and I but of course it goes against the grain of the institution. But I think it it ought to be possible to do that. I think and uh, uh, well, it perhaps applies to other areas as well. But I. I uh, I, I totally agree with this question. Of, um, so I, I do think that people learn through internalizing success, basically. The schools are lucky when they have something that's kind of persistently in the air, um, yes. but, but you know that somehow is about some kind of cross pollination between longer term projects and. Uh, There's one other thing I wanted to add, which has got to do with this question of discourse, discourse inside schools, because. I mean, of course, I'm very narrow-minded of me. I'm consciously fixated on schools of architecture. But uh, I, for example, the uh, Columbia publishes, as many do, uh, many other schools do, uh, a, a, a yearbook, a result of a year's production, you know, the so-called abstract. And you know, the la last one is very beautifully produced, and the one before 
you know, because the institution somehow cannot bring itself to really cultivate a discourse or discourses, you get a lot of material, you know, with a lot of projects, a lot of material, and it has this kind of flicker-like quality. You know, you you look through this thing and it they all, it's a kind of it's all the, it's also a mediatic and perhaps production problem. It's all the same, you know. It looks as though sometimes at its worst and it's all been designed by the same person. As, because it's being filtered through a certain editorial and also te technological operation. And, and I think that, you know, cultures are, are produced but, you know, through a kind of discourse. And if the institution, for whatever reason, can't bring itself to try to cultivate the discourse, then this is, you know, it's an endless problem, I think. So we have about 20 minutes uh, left, uh, so I thought we'd open it up to questions from the audience. So there will be, I think, two, two micro, I knew George was gonna raise his hand. Um, uh, there'll be two microphones moving around the room, uh, so please just wait until you get one in your hot little hand and then you're ready to go. So. Uh, my question is, hello, am I on? Yes. Um, my question is for Craig Buckley and uh, Valerie Sterling, both of whom spoke in a slightly more optimistic tone about possibilities than Ben did. Um, um, but and in this regard, you, Craig, used the term, um, I'm paraphrasing now, but it had to do with uh, the possibility to engage other or different audiences in an architectural discourse, if you remember that commentary. I'd be curious if you, and perhaps you also, Keller, um, might cite a couple of s successful instances of that that you could tell us about. And don't be so modest as to exclude ones of your own. <laughs> well, I, um, I, will, I will return maybe to the uh, example of the Clip Stamp Fold exhibition on uh, Little Magazines. This was um, an exhibition about uh, really small scale production that architects were making during the 1960s and 70s on mimeograph machines, on offset lithographic presses, like the kind that I, uh, I showed. And we thought this would interest a handful of architects who maybe knew about these groups, maybe had an interest in this period in time. And in fact, we had a much bigger audience for it, one that was not only about uh, architects, but in fact, about designers, about artists, about people who were interested in uh, the environmental questions that appeared in the magazines of those periods. Uh, people who are interested in the social justice questions that appeared around uh, in those years in terms of community planning and activism. Uh, and the constituency that the exhibition drew changed uh, with each city that it traveled to. So when it traveled to Vancouver, it drew uh, a big uh, crowd that was interested in uh, the conceptual art of those periods and the way in which that was interacting with uh, our architectural thinking during those years. So that was one example where we had a much wider cultural resonance for uh, architectural culture, but it also spilled over into other domains as well. A band in London named itself Clip Stamp Fold and still is putting out records. So, I mean, there's a way in which the constituency is always larger than we suspect, I think, for architecture. Uh, we often think of our constituencies being perhaps too smaller than they in fact are. So. Well, I, I'm I, when when we were talking about plan a minute ago and looking at those covers and thinking about the you know, the very particular things that architects do that should or could have a much broader audience and now you know in in work that are doing really trying to in in, in design work and studio work really trying to think about it, another kind of pop popular culture audience for some architectural political messages but I but I also w wanted to think back to um, you know some work that that some students are doing and again it's like a different PhD it's kind of the the PhD that invents its own document uh, the work of some students who are doing what is almost what I think of as the equivalent of an architecture the architectural equivalent of a graphic novel um, it's scholarship that is de reliant on drawing. Um, so I think of someone like uh, Jesse Le Cavalier's 
uh, interrogation of a, of a gigantic logistical apparatus that is Walmart, and you cannot, you know, it takes scholarship. You, they're not going to give you these details about w what this organization is. You have to piece them together, and, in, and then it's an architect who kind of draws the landscape of that, how it works, how it's met, the dimensions, the instructions embedded in it. It's something that an architect does. And yet it has this, and, and the, but yet the drawings have this other appeal that suddenly makes clear this organization that you've been surrounded by, but that you, you, you've never been able to somehow understand its secret code. The other example that comes to mind is the work of A.L. Weitzman in the Forensic Architecture Group, which uh, would take something like uh, the Google image, uh, uh, Google images of various drone strikes and through a kind of very precise looking at the limits of the resolution of a Google uh, of a Google image, be able to try and extract some plausible narrative about where drone strikes, which are never made public, the actual details, could have actually happened. And by drawing the evidence, in fact, by taking that evidence and redrawing it in the kinds of ways that you describe, in fact, assemble a much wider constituency which has considerable uh, stake in learning more about particularly drone strikes and the effects upon those the effects that they have upon the urban environment. So I think there are, there are probably many more examples as well. Which one? Well, they were just in the modeling and, yes. yeah, and yeah. acting and performance that yeah. in producing a sort of filmic uh, simulation of a space that um, allowed them to essentially um, throw a cover-up by the state police into question. And so yeah. that effect is, is quite literal and immediate and, and politically expedient, really, in the way that those techniques are deployed. So that's a really nice example, I think, yeah. of, of responsible. Do we have another question from the audience? Our illustrious guests. You mentioned the uh, new exposure that architecture has gotten through the use of um, print media or social medium. Uh, do you feel that... We're having a bit of trouble hearing you. Uh, is there... Can you hold the mic a bit oh, closer? Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was saying um, you mentioned the use of um, um, new print medium or social medium that's helped um, gain architecture more exposure in the last couple of years. Um, do you feel that um, the use of video... Oh, sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> use of video or um, um, film or even television medium is used enough to um, enhance the exposure of architecture in today's society compared to other um, specialties? Or do you think that this would create a more commercial effect and um, lower the discourse of architecture in a way? No, I, I, I don't think that there's inbuilt effects of particular media that print would be inherently less commercial than video or something like that. And I think there, in fact, are lots of uh, not only opportunities, but in fact, interesting ways in which uh, people can begin to use, or people have been using video uh, in the last, uh, in the recent recent years, it's particularly as video becomes much more ubiquitous in the way in which people can take videos with their cameras, but also edit them, upload them, and share them. So I think there's lots of uh, information there. In fact, um, if you think of the, the Spanish publisher, Actar, which uh, was firmly in the realm of printed paper uh, a decade ago, has largely moved now to a platform which is based around video. Uh, and that is, that is a good example of, of both a, a new way in which video is being used by a publisher to reach different audiences, but also to do very different things. At the same time, that's not entirely new. Uh, in fact, video has been a, a not only around for a long time, but used for thinking about architecture for quite a long time. Uh, if you think of the Open University uh, in England and the kind of programs that were produced for the Open University, I know that uh, the CCA is, uh, is thinking about working with that material. So uh, I think it's an incredibly important question, uh, not only in terms of the medium of video, but how we think about using video and how architects might use it in a way different from, say, other disciplines to talk about their particular form of knowledge uh, and share it with uh, uh, Share it in a different different way. Yeah. I'll apologize in advance for the incoherence of this question, but um, 
One of the things that's interesting about Adorno and, and Benjamin is that Adorno, in a certain sense, is a traditional bourgeois intellectual who has relationships to the institutional and institu institutional elite context and could be said to be able to move up and down in relationship to the wealthy and to popular forces. And in a certain sense, he has a scolding relationship to popular forces through his critique, let's say, for jazz. He's interested in jazz, but he sees it as a as a kind of corrupt popular formula which he would like to correct. Benjamin, on the other hand, is in a certain sense just on the edge of bourgeois society, barely making a living. And his effort is to understand mass society, what this new phenomena of a mass, what it means for human culture. And his interest in, in um, mass media is related to that understanding. <coughs> um, you could describe the society in which they're working in as unstable. That is, there's movement up from the bourgeoisie to the elite, and there's movement down, starting with the French Revolution, from the elite, the aristocracy, to the bourgeoisie, and even lower, depending on you know, the re revolutionary context, which really persists through the, uh, say, to the middle of, say, the 60s in the, in the 20th century. So my question is, to what extent, I I if you could say that in the, the period in which they're working, mass society is largely uneducated and that the bourgeois elites are educated and the elites are, the elites elites are educated. What's the difference in context now for the critic where you have a mass society which is arguably much, much larger but is in fact educated in a context in which you have similar conditions of concentration of wealth, so such that you now have a very educated mass society who don't have access to many things like architecture, for example. Um, so a sort of level of frustration that comes from that. And you have an elite, which instead of being this unstable elite that's engaging with questions, intellectual questions of culture, is more interested in questions of consumption and comfort, let's say. Let, we'll use the, the chap with the orange hair as an example of this, who are much less interested in engaging in any kind of intellectual questions. Like, what difference for the critic does this new context, this new kind of mass society present for them? Insofar as a critic needs an audience. Well, I mean, uh, one thing is it's a consumer society. Uh, and an expanding consumer society for for certain sectors of the society. And uh, there is a kind of disturbing relationship, I think, between uh, high-speed technological transformation in the society and the continuous consumption, con continuous consumerism. And I think that uh, the, the problem is that democracies find it difficult to to balance out this this predicament and um, I mean you, you it's, it's quite clear I think anyway neoliberalism has created a situation in which there is no vision except to expand the, the capitalist system further and to uh, escalate the maldistribution of wealth in the society while still maintaining the society's consumption. I think that that is quite different from the moments of Adorno and Benjamin. You know that that had this level of consumerism had not yet emerged then, and uh, so that, that that makes I think a very different mass society that is is hard to access in a way, given the conditioning of the society vis-a-vis -vis consumption and and the, and the the lack of any alternatives. I mean, the famous Margaret Thatcher, there is no alternative. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a great question and a difficult question. Um, I don't know if I have an answer for it, but I appreciate your distinction between Adorno and Benjamin. Um, Benjamin was certainly had more hope than Adorno when it came to media, but it was a kind of hope. It had a hope... Uh, it was a hope that was fueled by a certain desperation as well. Uh, and I'm struck always in reading that essay, the famous essay on the artwork in the age of mechanical reproducibility in terms of 
the way in which he stresses retraining and the possible retraining of the human sensorium that could be uh, brought about through a different use of media. And this might be one of the hopes. Whether, you know, today we live in a world where retraining means something very different. In fact, you're, you're right to point out the world is much more educated, but it's also much more precarious. And uh, retraining is much more about a kind of survival than about a, 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 a kind of revolutionary reorganization of the, of the sensible. But I wouldn't want to say that that's necessarily disappeared as a possibility. But it's certainly uh, more difficult to hold on to. You know. Just a it's just a, a a scrap of a thought, but um, you know, I was thinking as you you were talking, and then because we've been talking about Latour before, I was thinking about this essay that Latour and uh, Lepine wrote as an introduction to. Um, small volume about Gabriel Paz. And they said, you know, what, what would have been like if we had had no had had kind of trained our minds to think as much like Gabriel Tard as we had about Karl Marx, you know. So there are ways in which that idea which is not which is which is more about kind of social contagion of any kind, um, can, you know, m move through culture. Um, and get understanding the power of that is a very different political power than than the other kind of ideological um, political power or or adherence to to ideology. So there may be something. I mean, I end up putting my uh, some of my hopes in an, in another kind of infiltration like that um, that takes advantage of the um, of the good training and consumption. Okay, well on that uh, optimistic note, uh, my, uh, my masters have insisted that in the interest of everyone's schedule and good health, um, the dinner time and all that, that we uh, draw the event to a close. Um, so I just uh, hope that you'll join me in thanking our guests again for their insights um, and we hope to see you soon.